entirely my fault. I just booked too small an auditorium for too big a star. Um, so good evening and welcome to the 16th Vasanshet Memorial Lecture. We are truly honored to have um, Homi Baba as our speaker this year. So welcome Homi, welcome Naju, uh, Mrs. Asha Shet and the trustees of the foundation, Mr. K.M. Shet, the chairman of Great Eastern, Mr. Nadir Godrej, Ranjit Hoskote, friends and family, and um, everyone who's here because of Homi. Before we begin, I'd just like to tell you we're going to show a very short presentation on our foundation. It's five or six minutes. And this is going to be followed by Nadir Godrej, who will introduce uh, Homi. And then we'll have Homi. And Ranjit Hoskote will sum up Homi's lecture. And that will be followed by a vote of thanks by Mrs. Asha Shet and a presentation ceremony. So Homi wanted me to tell everybody that he has a second title to today's lecture and it's called Swimming Lessons in Bombay. So I leave you to that and welcome Homi. Sorry, the music hasn't worked this evening, so Homie's asked me to just read out some key. Uh, this is our scholarship section. We're just showing very few uh, of our projects. We've actually done about 75 projects in the last 20 years. Um, and so these are just highlights of just a few of them. We have this beautiful flute music. today who was an earlier speaker. We 
have a very active uh, education se sector in our foundation, um, mostly in Maharashtra and also in Orissa. current project which we've been working very hard on and it's coming close to fruition. This is a museum that we will have in Surat. Could I ask Nadir to come up? I often and wonder whether he could have stayed with us much longer so we could share his smile. He always made us feel much stronger and had no trace of guile. I'm a trustee of FMR, which he set on the track. Its research has now gone quite far, although we really lack a perfect cure for leprosy. Originally his dream, we minimize the misery with the efforts of our team. Now Asha, Ketu, and Aurobindo keep his memory live. In Vasant's wake, they smoothly flow, collectively they strive, promoting all to do with the sea in maritime education, history, and ecology by means of their foundation. This lectures now an institution with topics far and wide. The sea's a major contribution and K2 takes special pride each time we come back to the sea, from Sally's to the shore. And if it were left up to me, we would return much more. The sea to me is a primordial home where life itself was born. Though some may claim the celestial dome spewed extraterrestrial spawn to populate a barren earth, perhaps true ab initio, yet a watery interlude gave birth to the species that we know. We long for water of the womb, the comfort that it gives, yet raging tempests bring us doom. Who decides who dies or lives? Today, Homi will be our guide and mentor as we sail. He's eminently qualified to steer us through a gale. And where did he acquire this art? At first, in our Bombay, but Oxford also played a part, and then the USA. He's from the east and off the west, in Parsis both do meet. From each he learns to take the best, with aplomb he takes his seat in the Anne Rothenberg chair of the humanities. Another position he occupies there by courtesy of, if you please, dear Anand Mahindra, our good friend. I happen to serve on his board. Ten million dollars he chose to send, a sum few can afford. The princely sum set up the center for the humanities, and Homie's the director mentor, and he sends us his pleas. Humanities are not neglected, even as we specialize, for if this thinking is rejected, we'll fail to be as wise as all of us would want to be in a world so full of threat, 
While science gives us mastery, humanities can set the context for what to do. The how is easily learned. But all the same, it's very true, we really can get burned. If we can't deduce what's right, a careful reading is required with layers kept in sight and imagination fired. The humanities are there for all, delivering sense from strife. For those of us in the thrall, a guide to daily life. While literature is the major field in which he plays a part, he is well known to also wield much influence in art. Now in his thought and in his fashion, he's eclectic in his taste. Diversity is his passion, for consistency is a waste. Both, co both contrast and ambiguity make our learning deep. His intellectual ubiquity helps him to make the leap. His speeches are exhilarating, with thoughts that are profound. His delivery is scintillating. Sometimes he can confound. Some passages are very dense, makes readers seem quite dim. A deeper reading makes more sense, so shame on those who skim. <laughs> a careful reading is a must, as Homi does opine, and if we volunteer our trust, I'm sure we'll do just fine. Our government then took deep looks at all his contribution in lectures, catalogues, and books, and gave him the Padma Bhushan. For many years, he has resided in Cambridge, USA. To an interviewer, he confided that home is still Bombay. As he drives home, a feast awaits a home-cooked Parsi meal. His appetite he satiates. For him, it's a big deal. He eats so much he could get sick. There's chicken with jarred aloo, machi with sauce that's thick, and patties made from aloo. He loves this food, but even more, he loves the origin. The roux from France's distant shore, kichdi from strains within. Combining both fruit and meat is Persia's influence. It makes for an unusual treat, but what makes perfect sense is intertwining cultural strains in strands that give much pleasure. And this is how Homi maintains a store of cultural treasure. Homi claims we are treading water. We know he can do more. His abilities certainly ought to enable him to soar. His swimming lessons in Bombay will cut through all the tedium, and we will learn to find our way through life, the intemperate medium. Thank you. You see this innovative form of an informational film done in the style of the silent movies. You know, you can't look further for originality. And then you have the old bardic tradition, which spans in, my, in the interest of my own, uh, my own interest in cultural intersection from various Middle Eastern countries to India to, the, to Wales, Ireland. So here we have this many silver-tongued, many, many languaged bard. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all very much for uh, being here this evening. And um, in particular, of course, um, I want to acknowledge the great vision that uh, Vasant Sheth gave to his foundation and to the work that follows from it. Um, it is his inspiration that brings us here today. Um, it is his uh, mission in life to bring together the world of work, the world of merchants, the world of, 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 of wealth, and the wealth of ideas, the elements that make in any in any civilized and progressive society for a group of people to come together in the conversations of civil society in the public sphere. And I think that this is what an event like this manages to do. It brings together people from all walks of life. They come uh, expecting something, uh, something serious. Um, it gives them a sense of mindfulness and attentiveness, and I'm deeply grateful 
uh, and feel greatly honored that you come to listen to me uh, in, this, uh, in this place at this time, bearing in mind the memory of Vashant Seth. Of course, I want to thank Asha Ben for inviting me. Thank you so much. It's, uh, as I said, an honor. Ketiki and Oro have been remarkably supportive, wonderful friends. Um, Oro even allowed me to lull him to sleep with an early draft of my talk uh, earlier this afternoon and gave me the confidence that even if you found it uh, tedious, I, he, he uh, suggested that you might be lulled to sleep by the rhythm of the talk, which is actually about water in T.S. Eliot's work. I want to thank Geneviève for uh, making wonderful, efficient arrangements. Um, and I want to thank the Vashan Shet Board for inviting somebody of my age to give a lecture on water. Well, is that a curious formulation? I spend much of my day at my age drinking water to maintain a certain degree of health and I spend much of the night <laughs> expelling it. So I feel that I have a very intimate relationship to water, although I do not participate in any water sports. In fact, I'm going to speak today precisely about the way in which the outside world, the world, external world, impacts on our affects, on our internal affects. And so I feel I'm well practiced in this, having you know, become myself the sort of the cycle of water. Water taken, water life, death, regeneration, I experience it on a daily basis. Thank you, thank you very much. Under the shadow of the Elphinstone College. And in fact, I chose, amongst various things I was thinking of doing, I chose to focus on um, T.S. Eliot's great water poem the wasteland, possibly one of the great poems about water um, in, 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 of our time, because I, it was there at Elphinstone that um, in the English uh, honors seminar, the first seminar of the semester of the term, uh, we gathered together um, under the baton of several uh, gifted teachers to read The Wasteland. It was a class of extraordinarily gifted and intelligent people. And I have to say, to use a nice American word, we were all gobsmacked. Nobody knew what to do with this poem. So I thought I should return to that moment in some way. Thank you very much for being here. Am I clear at the end of the room? Treading water, reflections on an intemperate medium, oh, swimming lessons in Bombay. I could never learn to swim, nor could my mother. My stately great uncle on my mother's side, overweight and overbearing, dismissed his doctor's suggestion that he should take a daily swim. A daily swim in our climate? He scolded, total damn nonsense. And what am I supposed to do in the monsoon? Get wet? <laughs> My father, who frequently used the phrase utter contempt, had utter contempt for those of us, especially boys, who couldn't swim. He upped the ante and gave his own boyhood swimming lessons a heroic cast. Swimming was a survival skill and should be taken seriously. He said, all it took was guts, he went on. At the Golwala Parsi Baths in Bombay, we were thrown into the water, attached to strings and tin, tin floats. Hot maro, pug maro, hot maro, pug maro. Sala bailao, that's what we did. Did we sink, did we drown? We bloody swam, and you people have expensive lessons in Kanduai. What else were we to do, he said, sink, drown, namby-pambies who hung around the Willingdon pool 
ogling kejriwal toast, were typical dooth pounds or milk salts, utterly contemptuous. And Papa was determined to rouse me from my sloth, my greed, and my effeminacy. I was handed from teacher to teacher until I landed in the arms of that unsinkable, inflatable Mr. Bartena, <laughs> who created a minor tsunami each time he eased himself into the water. <clears throat> are, 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 no tensing up, Dikra. Just lie back and tread water, slowly, slowly, slowly. Neither my father's utter contempt nor Mr. Bartena's gentle blandishments could keep me afloat. Try as I did to heart Maro and pug Maro, despite every effort to tread water by lying back and thinking of Kejriwal toast, the Nambi Pambi, mother's boy, Dooth Pao, also known as Hammy, Humla, and Holmes, could never, would never learn to swim. These conversations around the swimming pool might just as well have taken place on the psychoanalyst's couch or in the psychiatrist's office. We are often too careless with what is said and done in our childhoods, treating these events as mere child's play, neglecting the determining marks of our early years that return to become prime players in the emotional dramas of our adult lives. Common knowledge would suggest that the fear of water or, or swimming is associated with the idea of drowning and the primal anxiety of death. And it is true that at this very time, I was obsessed by a childhood fear of death. I was seriously convinced that I would die every night. This time round, there was no swimming coach persuading me to tread water are, are, gently to let the surface of the water carry me. My mother consulted a psychiatrist who, to our surprise, had a familiar story to tell. Well, to put it simply, he's suffering from a pathological form of anxiety known as floating anxiety. No, no, you can laugh, that's all right. It was sad for me, but I mean, in, with the passing of time, it's actually quite funny. For him, danger is everywhere, security nowhere. His ego is overburdened and overwhelmed by affect. The psychiatrist's technical jargon passed me by because internally I was screaming, Hatmaro, Pagmaro, Hatmaro, Pagmaro until I was trapped in a hyperventilated state. It was then that my mother resorted to the metaphor of water, to a tsunami no less, to calm me down. I cannot promise you that you won't die tonight, but that is as likely as all of South Bombay suddenly and without any warning signs being hit by a tsunami. Initially, I panicked at my mother's refusal to reassure me about not dying. I can't even swim, I thought, and now I have to contend with a possible tsunami just to chase away the fear of death. Then came a rare moment of morbid reflection. The probability of my dying one night was far higher than the occurrence of a tsunami in Bombay. But you will agree that the probability of my repeatedly dying again and again every night on a daily basis, which was the nature of my neurotic affliction, was far lower than a freak tsunami on the coast of Kaf Parade. How often can a man die? Can you ease anxiety by imagining an even greater catast catastrophe, however improbable, at the psychic level. Truth to tell, I attribute my halting recovery from death anxiety to the moment of my mother's utterance. It was not that my mother's words were startlingly true or that her analogy was particularly apt. What my mother had given me in her little parable of improbability 
Your daily death is as unlikely as a one-time ever tsunami. With the rudimentary elements of a story that did not repress my anxiety, in fact, she evoked my fear initially, I cannot promise you that you will not die, only to then displace the improbable occurrence of a tsunami in a narrative. What comforted me was the image my mother made possible for me to project myself onto, to prop myself with, outside of the dizzy hell of anxiety. She conjured up a little story for the eye and the ear. The fearful boy finally asleep, lulled by the calm Kolaba waters, holding at bay nature's massive cataclysm. I could lose myself in the story, repeat it again and again to calm myself, and then, over time, from another place, in another direction, return to myself. I hadn't overcome my anxiety. Do you ever overcome the fear of death? The fear of death? Do you ever overcome the anticipation of the loss of your parents? Do you ever overcome the unfinished future still held in the hands of one you once loved and left? Do you ever overcome the shame of losing your mind or your memory or indeed your money? These are the shared narratives of anxiety that come with the affects of loss. And we can only learn through the consolation of art or the confirmation of the gods to live beside them, side by side. My daily fear of death was not a fear of extinction. My fear of swimming was not a fear of drowning. Both, one physical, the other psychic, were to do with a much more complex state of being than the polar conditions or alternative fates of life or death allow. My anxiety was to do with the struggle to survive, to survive the fear and live to tell the tale to learn to work with the, with the roiling surface of the sea and let it hold you aloft, to surrender your anxious wakefulness to sleep and to succumb to the night with its phantoms. My floating anxiety taught me about the importance of insecurity for the making of art. And from the rudimentary narratives that salvaged me, I learned about the living flesh of language deeply embedded in the mind of men and women. Anxiety, I have come to believe, is as essential a struggle for the temperament of art as the comportment of beauty plays its part in art's constant struggle with form and material. Swimming lessons in Bombay were my earliest intimations of the profound link between anxiety, the complex nature of human survival, and the poetics of narration, figuration, and the making of images. It is water, that intemperate medium, that brings all these together. My lecture tonight will work with the theme of water in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I will look closely at the poem not only because I am a myopic academic, I may be that too, but because with Edward Said, I believe in the utter importance of cultural philology as it mines each word for its nuance and measures every aesthetic or political practice for its values. In his last will and testament, Humanism and Democratic Criticism, Said describes a humanist philology. It is the means, perhaps, he writes, the consciousness we have for providing the kind of finely antinomian or oppositional analysis between the spaces of words and their various or origins and deployments in physical and social space, from private to public from silence to explication and utterance, and back again, back and forth 
back and forth between the painting and the world, back and forth between the text and the world. It's that back and forth. It's the continual desire to explore the relationship in every one of its nuances, in every one of its new emergencies. That, for me, makes it very important to return to classic works that are classic because people have gone back and forth to drink the waters of the wasteland over now uh, uh, almost a century. The connections between the symbol of water, the anxiety of survival, and the desire for security embodied in the complex figure of the mother, not simply a person, but also a complex of ideas, the mother, go back a long way. There is a rich archive of transcultural mythology and psychiatric and psychoanalytic dream analysis that suggests that birth is almost invariably represented by something which has a connection with water. We know this mythologically, we know it philosophically. One rescues someone from the water or is rescued by someone. That is to say, the relation of caring and security is one of mother to child. Such dreams are often associated with anxiety and have at, as their content such subjects as passing through narrow spaces. The connection between birth and the act of being rescued from danger in relation to water, pointed out by Freud very early on, reflects social and psychic anxiety as it occurs at the point of entry into the symbolic and affective realms of both private and public life. The possibility of death in childbirth or the loss of the family line, for instance, reflects the proximity of life and death in the symbolic realms of social anxiety. The child forced into a space outside the maternal body is again just one instance of the psychic anxiety associated with the side-by-sideness, the proximity of both birth and separation. Both traumas are undoubtedly transformed. So these are not simply traumas of birth. They're transformed or perhaps better still translated through time. Yet the floating anxieties associated throughout our lives with questions of inclusion and exclusion societal or familial, with notions of autonomy and in the insecurity of freedom. Identity and difference are part of the ecological footprints of our everyday lives, as well as the status markers of our social and professional practices. These things don't go away. They just translate in different ways. Analysts point out that anxiety appears when the presence of the mother, and I suggest the mother is not simply a person, is a person, but also a complex of social ideas, are lacking. Maternal security extends to all those affective, intellectual, and institutional conditions in which you feel cared for, fully capacitated, and at home in both the physical and psychic sense. So these could be any of these holding institutions that we have, the school at a certain point, the university, the college, extended friends, uh, groups, political groups. All of these are holding uh, for us, holding, secure giving, the things that make you feel at home in the world. Although anxiety is most typically associated with behavior patterns, what is crucial to my argument today is the way in which symptoms of the vulnerability of anxiety, fear, shame, insecurity, danger, humiliation, are signified in language, image, and forms of cultural representation. I have deliberately introduced the subject of anxiety through the symbolic arts of myth, or indeed of psychoanalytic dream analysis or psychiatry, because the deep immersion of those disciplines in the question of affect and the symbolic representation seems to me to be much closer to art and literature. Everyday familiarity collapsed for me one monsoon morning in a fusty classroom at Elphinstone College in an English honors seminar presided over by the three fates of the Anglo-Parsi school of Oxford Lit Crit. 
Professors Kamal Wood, Homai Shroff, and Meru Jasawala. I encountered a poem <coughs> that unsparingly announced its spiritual and cultural anxiety and did so predominantly through the symbolic presence or absence of water. I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead and I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light, the silence, od unde leer das Meer, empty and desolate is the sea. I clearly remember the silence. I clearly remember the silence amongst my classmates that followed the end of our reading of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, one of the most anguished and anxious poems of all. Civilizational and cultural literacy, it was overwhelming. The poem speaks in half a dozen languages, sings Wagner, jazz riffs and popular pub ditties in the same breath, ventriloquizes the literary and spiritual canon from Dante and Shakespeare to Gautama Buddha, Ecclesiastic, Saint Augustine, and Charles Baudelaire. All the while before our eyes, an exemplary modernist montage was revealing itself, built on the anthropological armature of myths such as the Fisher King. The poem ends, as you well know, with the invocation, Shanti, 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 which made it a kind of popular Indian Bolly Hollywood uh, success for a while. And when it was first published in 1921, many a sensible critic felt that for all Mr. Eliot really knew or cared, the poem could have ended with panty, panty, panty. True, I haven't made this up for the occasion. Read as an allegory, the wasteland has an has an iconic status amongst poetic testimonials to modern history. Its dominant theme is the profound desire for the relief and succor of water. Now, of course, we could put this in a much larger ecological argument. Its dominant theme is the profound desire for relief and the succor of water as a symbol of regeneration and renewal. Such an aspiration was ferociously mocked by the dismal conditions existing then in Europe. Think about it. The defeat of the Central Powers in 1918 brought about the end of the traditional order throughout Central and Eastern Europe with the collapse of the German, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman, and Romanov uh, empires. Civil war and unrest continued in most of these countries through the early 1920s. In Eastern Europe specifically, the trend was towards war with the new Soviet Union fighting enemies internal and external in Siberia and on its western and southern borders. The years 1920 and 1921 were still heavily in the shadow of the Great War. The dispossessed of the former dispensation still wandered Europe looking for a refuge. The post-economic boom that was to come and the decisive break from the past of the Jazz Age, what was known as the Jazz Age, had not as yet gone underway. The negotiations of Germany's war debt resulted, as you would know, in the catastrophic Weimar hyperinflation, which began in 1923. So what is so interesting about this moment of the wasteland, it is an, inter it is an interval. This, it's an in-between moment. It's the most insecure kind of moment. It's a purgatorial moment. It's a moment where people don't quite, something huge has happened, there's been a catastrophe. Very much the kind of structure of, an ang of, a, of a traumatic anxiety. Something has happened, and now you're trying to work it through. You're in that process of working through. You don't know what the terminus is going to be. That's the moment that reflects that in-between moment. And you know, many analysts um, and mythologists of anxiety also say anxiety is a kind of in-between stage. And any of you who have had anxiety attacks, as I have had, know that it's that sense. You don't know where you've come from and you don't know where you're going to. And you're gripped in this thing. You don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know how long it has taken. 
You don't know where you are. It's disorientating. And it's that kind of moment that Eliot read out of the history. But as I will say later, it was very irritated when people returned the poem into the history, thinking that all the transformative work he'd done language, through imagination, through drawing on psychic and powers of affect and putting them into this poem, all that was lost if all you did was read it as a historical allegory. To read the poem thematically allows you to dodge its formal disjunctions and jump over its wild juxtapositions and arrive more or less intact at the end of the final section, which is what the thunder said to Datta, Deyadavam, and Damiata. At the start of that concluding section, however, occurs a poetics of anxiety played out around a haunting, anxious mirage of water, an illusion of light as dry as the desert in which the mirage lies in wait for the thirsty only to deceive them. The scene of trauma or the loss of security, natal or social, registers in the form of the poem as a montage of abbreviated citations and quotations, each one cut out of its fuller original context. Once assembled in the wasteland, these fragments that come from a whole range of texts, musics, languages, as the poet said, these fragments are shored against my ruin. They don't find a new unity. And they seem to emphasize something missing in their representation. The whole poem is an assemblage of something just about missing, of some kind of meaning just emerging and then just missing. It's this just missingness which Many analysts say the missing representation is the way in which anxiety symptoms work, and the poem works beautifully in that way. Every moment it comes somewhere, it just about misses and goes somewhere else. It's a sort of a weird game of poetic billiards, if your billiards is like mine, which always misses. Um, There's something missing continually in the various systems of representation, something hollow at the symbolic level, something awry in the images, something strangely off in the syntax itself. The anxiety of such missing representations creates an insecurity of not being at home. Repeated attempts to recover a satisfactory, fuller aesthetic meaning or to restore a more complex symbolic presence or to achieve a stability of thought, whether it's in the reading of the text, the making of an object, or the living of a life, results only in exacerbating the symptoms of anxiety as the affective discourse of missing representations takes its grip, not only on the poem, but on our imaginations as we read it. It is in this sense that anxiety as, as an existential condition or an affective structure of the emotions is seen as being unhomely. You know you're somewhere and yet you don't know you're at home. You see something familiar and it is completely unfamiliar at the same time. Unhomely, or what as the Germans call it, unheimlich, for a philosophical tradition that goes from Freud and Heidegger to Derrida and Deleuze. Heidegger writes, I think, very beautifully, and I quote, in anxiety, one feels uncanny, unhomelike, being in the world enters into the existential mode of the not at home. Every day, familiarity collapses. There's also a brilliant bit in Heidegger's Being in Time where he says, anxiety is like walking in the darkness. You see nothing in the darkness, but you know that the external, you're more careful about the intrusion of the external world than ever before, because you've got to maneuver, maneuver yourself in the darkness. You don't see it but it actually shapes your whole sense of being and your whole sense of who you are. The effect of not being at home as part of the art of anxiety, akin to the wasteland in certain ways, is to be found in the work of the great American artist, Cy Twomley. Could we have the slide, please? Oro. I cannot pass to my reading of Eliot without paying a moment's tribute to Twomley's poems to the sea. In fact, I had completely passed on until I spoke to Oro this afternoon, and he said, Try and see, even at the last moment, if you can say something, even a little paragraph about Said Twombly. So just before coming here, I wrote this paragraph. If it's bad, blame Oro. Um, I cannot pass to my reading of Eliot without paying a moment's tribute to Twombly's poems to the sea. 
graphic inscriptions, markings, scribbles, scratches. You know, people look at Twombly, and what, this cost 45 million US? This? What, what is it? And so I thought it'd be a distraction to show it, because I'd have to say so much before we actually got to the work. But I just decided to throw it in to create a tsunami. You know, um, and he also happens to be one of my favorite artists, but that's another matter. Graphic inscriptions, markings, scribbles, scratches, call them what you like. These works exist, as Twombly puts it in one of his writings, in the duality of sensation as the multiple anxiety of fear and desire. There is no artist who is less capable of simply treading water as his anxiety radiates on the surface in a whole range of these misrepresentations. Across a field of erasures, you can see things written and erased, overpainting, white on white painting, um, an attempt to lay the canvas with white. He, he's very interested in working with white and then laying the white over the canvas with, with paint and then pretending that the canvas has any strength at all, that the canvas is completely fragile, that only the paint, the surface of the paint is holding the painting up. I can see many of you wanting to bid on this at the next Christie's auction. We'll keep your pocketbooks warm. Um, <clears throat> I'm only going to give you a little taste of why I think you see that this notion of misrepresentations across a field of erasures, overpaintings, layers done and undone. The white paint at war with itself as it attempts both to lay over the canvas and then deny the canvas its own support and depth. Out white, white, he wants to outdo white, wipe out the illustrative, water without end, poem without words, drawing without lines, almost. Act, act says Twombly, is the primary sensation. Now, when you look at a Twombly and you say act is the primary sensation, well, then give me a movie if you're making the painting. You know, there it is, there's some value. It's not so different from certain woodcut traditions in Japan, you know, where what comes out the other end is almost not as important as the pressure you, as the pressure you put in doing it. This is what I call facture. And that, I think, is extremely important. We tend to look at the image or the mark, but not that process, which is as much part of the aesthetic process. And I think architects understand that actually very well. The whole thing is part of it. It's not just the image. That's why when people take you know, walks and look at buildings from the outside and yes, no, A plus, B minus, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They look at architecture as image. That's not it. Twombly is a lesson in that. Act, he says, is the primary sensation. And they all clamor to try and understand him for the poetics of Mallarmé, who was also very interested in writing his poems in the whiteness of the paper that he wrote it on and how looking at the white through the language, what the effect of the white empty paper had on the poems itself. Everybody, when looking at Twombly wants to talk about Mallarmé. <clears throat> Um, but then I say, if all action is primary, then Sai, of course he's now dead, so you'd say, dear Sai, you should have come to learn from Bombay. If what you want is action, hat maro, pag maro. The imminence of meaning, the moment at which meaning appears, the imminence of meaning and feeling, catching it as it emerges, is what Swai Twombly and Eliot both are interested in. Not thematizing, not the distance, the, the, this, the viewer, the reader in the work, working with the work. And I think that is so important. That's why it's in a way against image and for, uh, for process. And then I understood much, much later in, my, in life that my father was obviously a great influence to Sai Twombly. Hat maro, bag maro. Which water is invoked in the poem. Its presence is always accompanied by a qualifier of time or space that attests to its loss or its lack. Water as a verbal sign with spiritual and ritualistic qualities is mentioned, but it is only represented in erasure and in absentia. 
It is always missed or a missing representation. Water, the survivor, the thing that will save you, is itself the anxious medium itself. If that's going to be anxious, then where do you go? I have a suggestion at the end. Water is mirage, here and not here, visible and virtual, iterative and intangible. You can't get it, but it keeps returning. After the torchlight, could we have the, thanks. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and place and reverberation of thunder of spring every di over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water, but only rock. Rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we would stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and the feet are in the sand. If there were only water, Amongst the rock, dead mountain, mouth of carrier's teeth that cannot spit. Here one can neither stand, nor lie, nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-crack houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and the dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. Faced with these verses, the silence in our Elphinstone seminar room grew more anguished. The simple truth of my swimming lessons came back to me. The difficulty of these stanzas persuaded me initially that it might be just simpler to give up and repair to the Elphinstone canteen and get one of their leaden cold batata waras. But then I recalled that the fear of swimming was in reality the desire to float, to survive the experience and recall it, anxiety and all, and embed it in yet another story, that that is the way narratives work. Pug maro, hot maro, I said to myself and bravely swam on in Eliot's shimmering spectral waters. Once floating in anxiety embeds itself in the elusive poetics of water, the act of reading like swimming must become performative. Emotional affects like anxiety or ecstasy or shame can only be heard when the verses are lifted off the page through the agency of articulation. I think it's one of the ideas of Sai Twombly. You have to get the, you have to pick the work, pick the image as it is coming off the page. You've got to lift it off. It is through the process of the enactment of the verses, not a theatrical enactment, but a study of the way the, the, the verses are making meaning as you are reading them, not a summary description of the theme of the poem, that we can hear the elusive moments that outlive the sense space of the line, its core of ideas or content, and lead us to that place where feeling resonates with, above, and beyond meaning where feeling and meaning move side by side in this lateral relation. It's not that the feeling has to be subsumed into the meaning or the meaning subsumed into the feeling. It's that side by side tension. If there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock 
where the hermit thrust sings and the pine trees drip, drop, drop, drop. Here you begin to see, if there were not the non-water, then the water wouldn't in itself come, but the water isn't there. It's this purgatorial in-between that Eliot is continually struggling with at the level of language, at the level of thought, at the level of the concept of tradition, at the level of the concept of history, at the level of the concept of politics. Eliot became increasingly tolerant of readings that turned the poem into a commentary or a social tract of the times. He insisted that what he was trying to do with the wasteland was much more about the negative stamp of public affairs on his own affective or emotional history during a period which he describes in a letter as being, in some respects, the most awful nightmare of anxiety. The unsettling symptom of anxiety lies in the failure of the sign of water to occupy the present tense without qualification. And this is one of the reasons why I decided to read or to create a poetics of anxiety to read the poem, not to allow it to return back into a kind of historical commentary or an emotional commentary of historical events. Water is uncertainty located in the past and future. Its presence is negated, displaced, elided. This is why I describe water as mirage, a static description of Eliot's poems, as is often taught thematically, is an exercise in erudition. The ardent, ungratified desire for water, as divine grace, for instance, lies in the details of the poem's grammar and its metrical form, because that's the way language moves through space and time while creating the conditions of become emotionally and imaginatively moving. That's it, not the summary. No water, no water, rock without water, if there were only water. Each of these moments is creating a different subjective position from it to, uh, for the reader, for the poet, a different dialogue, a continual changing of the mise-en-scene of meaning itself. If there were water, this is what I mean by the performative. If there are not water, if the water sounds only drip, drop, drip, like anxiety's intermediary position in the realm of the human psyche, according to the great French analyst Andre Green, the spectral ghost-like presence of water flows through the poem between two deaths, before and beyond life, between biological death and psychical death. So its reality appears very fragile, very evanescent, continually threatened. The corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence. That's friend to man, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. Is there no respite from this insecurity? this confusion between memory and history, the past erupting in the present? Is there no comfort in these times of spiritual and social anxiety? Eliot, I believe, makes a late answer to these questions, but one that is remarkable for its profound insight. This does not prevent it from being elliptical and enigmatic in a way that I hope you have come to accept. Who is the third who always walks beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is it? on that other side of you. What is that sound high in the air, murmur of maternal lamentation? My reading is focused <clears throat> on anxiety rather than the traditional emphasis, which is on the Christian ideal of agape, the selfless love exemplified by Christ. If I had fully embraced the path of agape, then I would have suggested that the hooded third who walks beside you represents the figure of Christ on the road to Jerusalem, 
who was unrecognized by his passing disciples, but that did not deter him from being beside them in disguise. From the perspective of anxiety, however, I want to argue that this ambiguous and delayed disclosure of a man or a woman, I don't know which, who is on the other side of you, is a late emergence of the presence of the maternal principle of care and security. If the cause of anxiety is the fear of the loss of the mother's caregiving, then the high sound of maternal lamentation, it could be, of course, a Marian reading of the Bible too through Mary, uh, but, it, but I think it, it, I, I, want, I want to push for, the, uh, for, the, for this more secular anxiety as a part of it, restores the figure of the mother as witness and supplicant in the age of anxiety. Like water, of which she has been both symbol and spirit, the maternal murmur presents some possible mitigation of anxiety, some partial fulfillment of the missing representation that signifies the mother's absence. There is some symbolic repair at this point. Face to face, the maternal is invisible and cannot be numerically counted. When I count, there are only you and I. But at an oblique angle, side by side, there is always another one walking beside you. And this notion of side-by-sideness is extraordinarily important because it changes the whole relationship both to authority, to God, which is usually vertical, which is usually in, uh, ahead of you, above you. And here we have this peculiar notion of thinking of both ontology and theology, and Levinas is a great example of this, as a side-by-sideness. And to me, this is, Wittgenstein is another great thinker about the side by side. Wittgenstein said, you know, I'm never interested in building vertically. What I'm interested in seeing is other possible foundations. This notion of coexistence in a lateral side by side ethical way. Not about sovereignty, but about solidarity. So then side by side is extremely important, I think, in, a, in, in this part. When I count using quantification, there are only you and I. But at an oblique angle, side by side, there is always another one. And you see how we return to that notion of anxiety as always missing a representation. So you say, when I count, there are only two. But when I look, there are three. So there's always something missing in the realm of symbolic representation. And I believe at the end of the poem, Eliot gives us, on the one hand, the Pieta, but on the other hand, the possibility of the reading that I'm presenting based as much on anxiety, or more on anxiety than on agape. I think it's the side-by-sideness of these two things that makes it such an important poem for people who are religious or theological, as well as people who are entirely secular. In a world of broken images and fragmented ruins, there may be no transcendence or epiphany, no revelation. There is, however, what in the book I'm completing, I call an ethics of care, a politics of security, protection, and representation, and cultural practices of witnessing and testimony. These, you will remember, were the very values with, that, with which I started my reading of The Wasteland. Care comes from the Latin cura, which is also where the curator comes in. But care comes from the Latin cura, which signifies both anxious in exertion, I am careworn, anxious exertion, as well as caring, nurturing, protection, security. It's one of the great words. It's about care and worry, and it's also about protection, the easing, the mitigation of anxiety. But because the word speaks in two tongues, Anxiety can never go. One has to learn how to mitigate it. And that, of course, is also part of the whole struct, psychoanalytic structure of how you, what anxiety is. In a world of broken images, uh, sorry, uh, care comes from the Latin cura, which signifies both anxious emotion, exertion, and profound carefulness with the lives and times of others. 
In a world of broken images and fragmented ruins, there may be no transcendence. There is, however, an ethics of care. If we listen with due care to what is called the murmur of maternal lamentation, we are led to another stretch of water in the poem, the Thames, that cuts through the wasteland. And very often, the Thames is seen as the part of the, of, of a place of sterility. Uh, Auden, I mean, Eliot was a, you know, a, 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 a very profoundly elitist, so I mean, it's the place where the working class lived. It's a place of no morals. It's a kind of Gomorrah. Whereas the, you know, the, the, the loss in the desert, the earlier parts that I read, where the, where, you know, where the pilgrims went in the desert, confronted the stone, that's a kind of non-specified, a non-specified landscape of spiritual development. Whereas the Thames is full of pubs and drunkards and loose women, etc. So, there, there, as always, I'm saying in this poem, the poem is so unresolved in its own anxiety, and I think that's what has not often been brought out. Um, reading the poem this time round from the perspective of anxiety and the flight of the mother persona, I'm surprised at its relentless portrayal of the physical and erotic indignity towards women. The erotic indignity, I think this is very important. You know, we're all will willing to say women should be treated equal in the workplace, that's very important. But I think accepting the eroticism of women as a legitimate thing and seeing it and giving it the same say, that's where the real test is. Just like it is the eroticism of the male, whether the male is gay or straight, it is to accept that eroticism as it, a kind of a willingness of the person. That's the important thing. Not simply to look in terms of social engineering for equality, but really to listen to that deep creative eroticism. And here I find what is so interesting is how, and I've never taken the journey up the Thames, having come through the journey of anxiety, I've never done that before, and I found it quite surprising. What has been read in the critical canon as the sterility of the conditions of love in general on, this, on the banks of the Thames is much more stealthily predatory, I feel, and this is not because I have been oversensitized by the shenanigans of the Supreme Court here. But if you read that part of, of, of the Thames, you have the rape of Philomel, Mr. Eugenides on the prowl for a dirty weekend. Of course, this is also Eliot's anti-Semitism. You know, there are a number of people like that who are always on the prowl who belong to the minorities. He was not a great, greatly generous to minoritarian uh, aspirations. But just to go down the Thames with you, and we could go borough by borough, the rape of Philomel, Eugenides looking for, for, to, on the prowl for a dirty weekend, Albert who won't touch his antique, that's the word used, his antique wife who has bad teeth and has been repeatedly forced to abort, the Randy house agent's clerk who hangs on and hangs on and hangs on till his girlfriend is more or less exhausted and then, as Eliot puts it, flushed and decided, assaults at once. The stereotypical lady typist who makes a welcome of indifference. Well, now she says that's done, and I'm glad it's over. And I always think when I read about her that, you know, the usual Latin tag is post coitum homos tristus, after sex man is sad. This poor lady was actually much sadder before, after than before. She was already prepared. So this strain of, of women, this violation, which is read generally as the sterility of love, came across to me as a very anxious journey now. Something about, as I said, not accepting the eroticism and therefore, in a way, keeping out again, keeping out the, keeping out the maternal. Then I felt like asking, did care flee her home, her parched country, her wasteland? If indeed the maternal principle is related to care, did care flee her home, her parched country, her wasteland? Because like Tiresias, she, mother, partner, lover, sister, wife, daughter, had, and I quote, for suffered all 
enacted on this same divan or bed. As I read my lecture tonight, a night on which you have graciously listened for almost an hour to one man's act of reflection and interpretation, I feel a great gratitude to my teachers and colleagues at Elphinstone, with whom I first started this journey up the Thames and down the Thames and into the waterless desert. However, today I feel a profound stirring of anxiety, and I'm changing my direction as I end for the arts and humanities the world over. Some research I did a couple of years ago, albeit limited to the United States, revealed the fact that in the US in 2010, direct mailing expenditures, that is junk mail that is put through your door, were 45.2 billion, while expenditures on kindergarten to 12th grade and post-secondary textbooks totaled 10 billion for the same period. Now, I've changed gears very fast. I haven't come to make a pretty transition from what my reading of, of, of Eliot to the fate of the arts and humanities, and I've done it deliberately. Because that kind of analysis, whether you like it or not, is not possible without the funding of the arts and humanities. And I know sitting around here, there are people who are doing the best they can in a rather waterless landscape. Uh, and I wanted to end by saying that I think it's extraordinarily important to understand how important this kind of arts and humanities education, which gives you the opportunity for slow reading, for going back again, for thinking, for re-encountering the classics, and as I've tried to do today, to change their direction, to change the way in which they've been read. Without being parochial, I have to say that no other disciplines have been so bereft of the ethic of care. When the humanities are eclipsed, all of higher education loses an elusive yet essential measure of time, a measure of slow, reflective time, a temporality of visions and revisions that is crucial preparation for the exercise of public reason. That's the lesson in Eliot, too. If you think, if you have the time to work on the question of affect and the psychic, this is not merely work on the psychiatrist's couch. It is part of what I call the ecology of everyday existence. That is not possible without the kind of work that we can do here in arts and humanities and the importance of that. Scientific research is remarkably important. The scale is different. Scientific research and scientists are as absolutely committed to a better world as we are. And at times, they may be doing much more than I am rereading T.S. Eliot, although I disagree, of course. However, the history of scientific research shows that the ends are important. But in getting to those ends, scientists have of often made decisions, peremptory decisions to do with animals, to do with environmentalism. Scientists, science has made those decisions. In the humanities, that's not possible because every act of interpretation confronts you with your own sense of values. Every act of interpretation is value-based. It's not ends-based. It is crucial preparation, the arts and humanities, for public reason. A public can only achieve enlightenment slowly, Immanuel Kant wrote in his brilliant short essay, in fact, a journalistic piece called What is Enlightenment? And although the rush to technological immediacy and professional instrumentality are important signs of progress and should be encouraged, they are in danger of overwhelming our tolerance for the slow, the incremental, the repetitive, the iterative time it takes to make sense of arts and humanities. The back and forth of open-ended conversation, the ongoing revision of critical dialogue, remembering, repeating, and working through, interpretation and intervention, the entangled practices of doubt and deliberation, of giving doubt its time, 
before you come to the decision. The energy of aspiration, the suspension of judgment in the midst of purposeful agencies of action and value. These things take time and they take training. Anxiety is a strange hybrid of fear and hope, of agony and aspiration, and we have every reason, post Eliot, to be anxious for the humanities in both these senses. Podium to return one more time to the main subject of my talk this evening, swimming lessons. Yes, I tried them once more in a public pool near my London home, shyly slipping in on a weekday afternoon to practice Hatmaro Pagmaro in the baby pool. Weekday afternoons were the favorite hours for young mothers. It is true that I caused a few tsunamis which rocked the kids around a bit, and I thought they were thoroughly enjoying it. Their mothers certainly weren't. After hearing enough tight voices saying in a tone rather like Eliot's Thames, uh, Thames people, uh, Ari, don't go anywhere near that big fella. Ari, keep out of his way. He's, he's not very, very nice, you know. Ari, don't go near him. Now, come here, come here, come here. I ignored it at first until I realized that they thought I was what they once called a perv. <laughs> In fact, one of the mothers called me and said, don't you feel a little strange going in that water with those kids? Said, no, not particularly, should I? I gave up swimming lessons. They were too much trouble. Occasionally, with my father in mind, I feel like a bit of hot maro, pug maro, and then I look at Cy Twombly, or I turn to Joseph Conrad's masterly novel, Lord Jim. Nothing better than a bit of Conrad, red in cuff braid, with the sea at a convenient distance. Reading Conrad exercises, of course, a different set of muscles. It's no good for the abs, but it does wonders for my floating anxiety. Yes, very funny this terrible thing is. A man that is born falls into a dream like a man who falls into the sea. If he tries to climb out into the air, as inexperienced people often endeavor to do, he drowns. Nishtva, isn't that true? No, I tell you. The way is to the destructive element, submit yourself, and with the exertions of your hand and feet in the water, make the deep, deep sea hold you up. There is no end to the lessons I learned by not learning to swim in Bombay. Thank you. I was meant to provide a summary which would be impertinent and absurd because you cannot summarize what is at once an enchantment in the way in which it draws on the memories of practice, the memories of growing up in a certain place, of confronting anxieties, and of bringing all of those heritages, if you will, of affect and concern and uh, confrontation into the practice of writing whether it is criticism or whether that criticism or theory, as in Homie's case, exceeds the, the academic bounds conventionally positioned for it. And it opens out into a form of utterance that does not only add to our knowledge, but actually obliges us to reconsider our place in the world and our way in the world. 
So what I will respond with really very briefly is a set of affects in turn or affective experiences, which is also to do with the fact that for a number of us in this room, and certainly for Nancy and Girish and me, there was um, a very similar rite of passage, also in musty classrooms at Elphinstone, I think about 20 years after you transited through. And it also involved encountering Eliot's wasteland and um, encountering in it the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of reason can never retract. By this and this only we have existed. And the notion of the poem as talisman, as touchstone, as something that has philosophical import was something that, that, is, that perhaps was part of a certain kind of Elphinstonian pedagogy. And I'm very, very grateful, uh, as many of us here are, Homi, that you should have brought into play this autobiographical and memoiristic uh, tonality. And also, I just want to say how grateful we all are that you've taken the lecture the form of the lecture to its etymological roots, where you do not find a speaker, but you find the lector, the reader. And you've reminded us of how crucial it is that we recommit ourselves to acts of reading as bodied selves, as selves that are consumed by and, and that have to survive the kinds of historical and political contexts that you spelt out. And I want to say again that it is the way in which you drew our attention, whether it was through your close reading of Eliot or your reference only, or then very deceptively facetious to Cy Twombly, you reminded us that it is not only the texts and the accepted readings, but also the pentimenti, the erasures, the elisions, the evasions of a text and its reception that we have to address ourselves to. And that is perhaps an extremely important lesson to us, not only as aesthetic subjects here, but also as citizens in a particular political moment where we have forces that are rich in assurance, that are technocratic in the way in which they assure us that all will be well, and that are also monopolistic in terms of what they have to say about the past. So your performed, your performative gesture today of reclaiming the past and its many voices is a lesson not only for a kind of textual reading, but also for a kind of political being. There are other observations, but they are of a completely technical nature and need not detain us. I just want to say how very grateful and appreciative we are. Thank you all. My friends, I just want to narrate a little incident which I remember. This must have happened about 20 years ago when I was traveling by train from Kanpur to Delhi. And sitting next to me was a very noble looking professor on his way to Aligarh. And we started talking and what he said, you know, madam, nobody listens and listening is intelligence. I remember it very well till now. And I'm sure we have listened very deeply and we will cherish this moment. And now I want to thank my very illustrious speakers, Homi, Ranjit, and Nadir Godrej. I am so moved that such illustrious people are speaking in memory of my husband. I'm sure if he was alive, he would have started a think tank and enjoyed this just as much. And I want to thank all my friends who are here. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful. And I want to thank my trustees and my staff and all of them who worked very hard to make this a success. I want to apologize. I think we're a little overcrowded. But as the director of the museum, Mr. Mukherjee, said, Asha Ben, everything will settle down. Don't have any anxiety. And this is precisely what has happened. So I want to thank him also very much. And this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. And I must add one word before I finish. Ketki works very hard at these lectures, not me. I just come to give a bouquet or a plaque. She works very hard. She has really indeed made this lecture series a landmark in Bombay. And I'm very proud of her. And I thank her very much.
And may I now present uh, a plaque which we no. give. May I give a bouquet of flowers to Mr. Mukherjee first for being very gracious. The poet. To all the poets. Nadir, my friend, the poet. He, he composed the most beautiful poem in memory of my husband. And now the star, the star of the evening. <laughs> we, we couldn't actually assess how many people will come. And, and I'm very sorry if there's been any inconvenience, but we are very happy that there's a huge number. And may I give this to Homi? Digest. 